Okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, and welcome to this lesson of human AI interaction. Um, it will be mainly a practical lesson, so uh, I will introduce you to uh, conversational agents, probably in the first hour, showing also some practical examples and tools through which you can start then designing and prototyping your own conversational ag agents. Uh, and this will be the last exercise for this course. Okay, so you will start designing the agent today uh, and also implementing it. Uh, then you will have the opportunity to continue your work in the first two hours of the next lesson. And then in the last two hours, you will present your work uh, to us and, and the class. Okay, and this will be the last exercise for, for this course. Um, just to understand how many of you already use conversational agents in, in your research activities. Okay, some of you, one. Perfect, so you, will, uh, you can obviously use your own uh, expertise and, and tools in, in this exercise. Um, for the others, uh, you will have some exercises and some, sorry, some examples, uh, some codes that you can reuse and maybe modify a bit to uh, implement uh, uh, the, the exercise, okay? Um, and of course, we have seen different kinds of interaction and different kinds of uh, AI-based tools and conversational agents, also with the advent of ChatGPT and large language models, is probably one of the most uh, common uh, interaction technique and also one of the most common tools that we have uh, now. Um, so we will start with some background information about voice and speech. Is there any difference uh, between voice and speech in your opinion? There are differences, of course, but what's, what's the main one? Yes? Okay, uh, is this voice or speech? Voice. Uh, mm, yeah. No, it's the opposite probably. So uh, voice is, is the sound that you produce, uh, while speech also uh, takes into account, uh, for example, the language uh, and also uh, the different languages that you can, that you can use inter in interacting by a voice. Okay, so the meaning is related to the speech, right? While voice is, is the sound that you can produce, right? Okay. So, um, we can say that human voice is an efficient input modality. Um, you can give command to a computer uh, quickly, vocally. Um, and as I said before, uh, speech is language dependent. So speech may be uh, ambiguous, right? So we have seen some examples about, for example, Google Home with uh, elderly people, um, and also some examples about Alexa with different accents. Um, of course, fully understanding natural language remains, uh, I would say, a dream for now, even if with the advent of chat GPTs, we are, uh, uh, we are reaching a good level of understanding. Um, but anyway, voice and speech interaction became mainstream in, the, in recent years, thanks to Siri, Google Assistant, Alexa, uh, but also in a way with, with ChatGPT. Um, so these applications um, simulate uh, a natural language dialogue. Um, and of course, we, we have advantages and disadvantages. For example, we have seen that one of the most important disadvantages is that uh, the user must know uh, the language of the tool. So you cannot use any kind of uh, language. You have to say commands in the Alexa language, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and this may create frustration uh, and there is a learning curve. Uh, so users need to first learn uh, 
what are the uh, commands that can be used with a given, with a given device. Um, and this is quite different with respect to graphical user interfaces. Uh, why, in your opinion? What is the main differences between vocal interaction only and an interaction with a screen? Yeah, exactly. The presence of affordances. Uh, in a graphical user interface, you have a screen and you can instantly see what are the actions that you can perform on the screen, right? So there are affordances, there are visual affordances, uh, and you don't have this kind of affordances with a tool like Alexa, uh, the Echo Dot, or a Google Assistant, right? So this is the main difference that you should take into account when you are starting to design a conversational uh, assistant. So you must remember commands or you must learn commands before using the system. Um, so from a computer perspective, um, voice-based interaction is mainly composed of two main tasks, speech recognition, also called speech to text. So translating uh, the speech of the user into a text and speech synthesis, so text to speech. Starting from a text, uh, the conversational assistant translates this text into speech. Mm? And you can have systems that have one of these two tasks or both. Uh, so you can mix these two tasks um, and these two tasks, tasks are actually mixed in different uh, kinds of uh, conversational systems. So there are some applications that leverage uh, both of them. Um, there are also some applications that leverage uh, just one of them. So for example, uh, here are two examples probably. The first one, dictation.io, is a system uh, to which you can dictate your, your speech and this website will translate your speech into, into a text. Right? So in this case, this specific website is just using speech to text. Right? Um, with Google Translate, uh, you have both, for example. You can uh, dictate something with, with the microphone. Um, the Google Translate can translate your, your speech into another language, and then you can also reproduce uh, the translation uh, with, with uh, speech synthesis. Right? So you can mix uh, both of them. In some cases, there is also some natural language processing. I would say in most cases, uh, at least for our use cases of human AI interaction. And this is the, the difficult part. Uh, so Alexa, uh, Google Assistant, but also ChatGPT try to understand what you are saying. So it's related to the speech. Mm? It's not just uh, translating your speech into text or vice versa is also understanding the meaning of your speech to give you an appropriate answer. Mm? Um, so we can easily imagine when spoken interaction is useful and successful. Uh, and here I listed some of these uh, cases. So it's clearly uh, an opportunity using voice-based interaction when users have physical impairments, right? Either uh, also temporary physical impairments. Um, for example, when the speaker ends are busy, like we are driving on a car. Um, or when mobility is required. We have seen the example of the um, app application uh, that is useful to track running, but you can also use voice commands uh, when you are running. So when you're running, you are typically busy, you are moving. And so it's better probably to use voice instead of normal traditional interaction with a mobile application. Um, not only movement, but also when the, the speaker eyes are occupied. Again, like when we are driving and, and so on. Okay. So, and also it's, uh, um, this kind of interaction is suitable when the vocabulary used by the system is, is limited. Again, for the problem that we don't have any visual affordances. Um, 
or when the user is unable to read or write, like with children. So there are use cases in which voice-based interaction is, is suitable. There are also obstacles uh, for sure. Uh, we can encounter some, some issues in using this uh, interaction technique. Uh, first of all, when the, uh, the environment is noisy, especially when we are using uh, voice-based interaction, we will see that conversational agents can also be used uh, as a chat, as a chatbot, but when we are using voice, uh, there are problems when the environment is, is noisy. Um, again, commands need to be learned and remembered, the learnability problem. Um, recognition may be challenged uh, by strong accents. We have seen the example uh, from Alexa. Um, and also talking is not always acceptable. Okay, so uh, if some of you start now using a conversational assistant to access, I don't know, uh, her or his private emails, this would be really strange in this uh, contextual situation. Um, and there are also privacy issues, okay? So uh, you cannot probably insert a password vocally, for sure. Um, error correction can be time consuming, because again, you, you don't have uh, visual affordances and if you uh, if you do some mistakes in the interaction, you typically have to start from scratch. Um, so there is an increased cognitive load uh, compared to typing or pointing. Uh, some operations are, are difficult. You probably cannot uh, program uh, via voice. Uh, you cannot uh, develop your project via voice um, and, and so on. So these were the main obstacles. Um, so we have uh, opportunities, we have uh, obstacles. How can we design this kind of interactions via conversation? Um, these are probably the most important phases that you should take into account when designing uh, a conversational assistant. Then again, you can also use tools like the uh, Microsoft Workbook that we have seen last time that can give you some use cases, some scenarios to start designing the, the system. But anyway, first of all, there is the in initiation phase. Um, so you have to decide um, how the conversation will start. Mm? Typically in system like Alexa and Google Home, you have a wake word, a hey Siri, uh, okay Google, and so on. But, but you can also decide to have a physical button, for example, uh, to start the conversation. Or, like in Gbo, if you have cameras, microphones, you can also maybe decide to uh, make the system start the conversation automatically and autonomously. Uh, then, the second phase is knowing what to say. So, learnability, again, is one of the main issues of, uh, of this kind of technology. Um, so, you should also try to design a way to guide the user in learning what are the available commands, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, then errors will happen. Uh, so there are also, uh, there, there can be recognition errors related to speech to text. Uh, this kind of errors will happen. And so you have also to design how the user can recover from this kind of errors. Uh, so phase number four, correcting errors. Uh, and then the point number five, is probably the most difficult one, the one about natural language processing. Uh, so mapping the user input to possible actions. So you have to recognize the sentence uh, and also recognize the meaning of the sentence to associate to the command the right action. Mm? And this is probably the most difficult part. Um, and then you have also to design feedback and dialogues to recover from errors, for example, to be sure to start the right action. So after uh, executing the action, uh, typically you also uh, ask the user in some way to give some feedback to understand if the action was, was correct. So um, let's talk about conversational agents. Uh, as I said before, it's not just voice. You can have different kinds of, of systems that exploit conversational agents. Uh, also, conversational agents with user interfaces, and we will see some examples. 
Um, so mixing voice and screen is often a good idea um, because again, voice is an efficient input modality, especially for some use cases, uh, while screen, uh, while a screen is an efficient output modality uh, and it gives you some affordances that can minimize the learnability problem. Um, so you can also have this kind of devices that exploit voice interaction for the input part and the screen as, a, as an output uh, modality. Um, so, and there is also another opportunity. Um, so besides understanding the speech, so the meaning of, of the user language, uh, some of these conversational assistants also try to understand the voice of the user. So this is more related to the sound. So for example, Siri is trained to understand, to recognize exactly your voice uh, and should not be triggered if uh, another user talks to your Siri, hmm? right? Uh, and this is not true for other kind of conversational assistants like, like Google. Hmm? So to summarize, we can have uh, three different kinds of uh, voice user interfaces. Um, we can divide them in screen first systems. So systems that exploit voice, but the first uh, interaction technique is via screen. Voice only systems. So systems that just exploit voice for input and for output and voice first systems. So systems that mainly exploit voice, by, but they also have a screen for uh, other kind of activities. So can you make an example of a screen first system? Like chat GPT. Uh, yeah, you have to text your commands. Can you use the, the voice on ChatGPT? I'm not sure. I don't remember, actually. Okay, for the plus version, there is the app. Okay, this could be an example. Uh, another example, more common. Everyone has this device right now in, in your pocket. Uh, the smartphone in general, right? So it's a screen first system. You typically access your smartphone uh, through the traditional user, graphical user interface. But so this device um, is designed to be screen first, but it also has some voice based capability. Okay, there is, for example, Google Assistant, there is Siri, but it's not the main interaction possibility. You can use it but it's something that has been added later, right? So it's a screen first device. Um, an example of a voice only system. We have seen some examples last time. Uh, Alexa, for example, uh, or uh, Google Home. So they are physical devices that only uses voice as the interaction technique. And what about voice first systems? So systems that mainly use voices, but also uh, have a screen. We have also seen an example in the last lesson. Uh, yeah, it doesn't use voice, I think. No, this can be classified as a screen first uh, tool, I think. Jibo, Jibo was the conversational assistant with, with a screen uh, through which you can also interact in some way. Uh, so Jibo is an example. And there are also some um, Amazon Echo, I don't know if they are still uh, in, in the market, but some Amazon Echo with a screen. So they have the same capability of a traditional Amazon Echo, uh, but in addition, they also have a screen, for example, to see the results of a, of a web search. Mm -hmm. So also like machine learning or other uh, tools for uh, meaning creation? 
Uh, yes, this could be an example. Uh, so these kind of uh, chatbots through which you can also create images. Uh, you have also some visual affordances. You can see your image, the result on the screen. So this can be another example. Uh, it, it also depends if you are using voice or not, because typically uh, you are just writing your commands instead of using, of using uh, voice. So screen first devices, um, most of our contemporary voice interaction happens on screen uh, first devices, mainly smartphones. Um, so in this kind of devices, uh, designers and tech companies have introduced uh, speech recognition and language processing features. Uh, um, and these kind of features work uh, very well, uh, but the overall experience is kind of fragmented. Um, so there are some limitations. Um, there are missing functionality. There is a poor use of screen space while speaking. And there are also missing affordances. Um, so it's something that has been added, but we are not exploiting completely uh, this opportunity. Uh, for example, these are two examples taken from Siri and, and Google Assistant. Uh, users can start a task via voice typically, but then the next steps typically require some, some kind of actions via the touch screen. Right? So, for example, I can start a web search and Siri or Google Assistant typically answer, uh, okay, this is what I found on the web. And the Assistant displays the results on the screen. So you have to take your phone and using a screen first interaction technique. Okay? So there is no opportunity to complete the task entirely via voice typically. And this is kind of a missing functionality uh, that can be uh, a fragmented experience. Mm. And also some visual affordances are missing uh, in some cases, especially with, with Siri. Um, there are some cases in which you don't, you don't have the, the same visual affordances that you can have if you perform the same operation uh, via, via the screen. Mm. And Google Assistant is uh, slightly better in this. And also there is this kind of poor space uh, use. Um, so uh, in some cases, uh, when we are using this kind of uh, voice interaction in a screen first devices, uh, the devices th themselves uh, poorly use the screen space uh, for, these, for these tasks. And what about voice only devices? Uh, this kind of devices uh, do not have any, any screen at all, uh, like the Amazon Echo. So audio is for input and also output. Uh, there are some feedback likes in, the, in this case, but anyway, um, you can use these devices hands free. Um, there is a quite good accuracy in speech recognition. Uh, but this accuracy is good if you don't mix different languages, for example, in a sentence. So if, if you mix different languages, uh, this accuracy drops. Um, and there are no, again, visual affordances, and this can be a problem. Um, typically, this kind, there are also other limitations. Uh, so these kind of devices are quite prolix in the answers. Uh, and this can be frustrating. Uh, again, in this case, what is the difference with, with a traditional graphical user interface? So for example, let's imagine, okay, I ask uh, Amazon Alexa, uh, I don't know, uh, some receipts with my ingredients that I have at home. And Alexa starts speaking and it proposes to me a lot of different receipts. What's the difference between this kind of interaction and the same task completed on a graphical user interface? Exactly. 
Exactly, you can scroll results, you can easily skip information. With Alexa, you have to wait the end of the, of the response, right? So this can be frustrating. Um, some operations are challenging. Um, again, getting a weekly weather forecast is a memory test. This is another problem. Uh, with traditional uh, graphical user interfaces, I can skip information, but I can also visually see the information again. Okay, instead with a conversational assistant, I have to remember the results. Otherwise, uh, I will, I will lose, uh, I will lose my my information, right? Um, and some actions are not allowed or not expected, like for example, inserting a password via voice. It's not, it's not possible probably. Yeah, you you can do it, but it's not. Um, and then we have voice first devices. Uh, they are voice-only devices with a screen, so they have the same capability of uh, Alexa or Google Home, uh, plus they also have a screen, and this can be useful for, for example, for the limitations that we have just seen, for example, to display results on a screen, so that they can maybe skip information or remember information. So, uh, these systems uh, primarily accept user input via voice commands and may also augment audio output with visual information. So the output will, will be again via voice, but you also have the screen to augment this kind of, of output uh, with some visual affordances. Uh, typically, the graphical user interface is less capable than the one in a screen first device and also typically the display is a touch screen. So the focus is still on, on voice. Okay, these were some examples of uh, different kinds of conversational agents. Uh, how can we design these kind of systems? Um, because of course our design choices will influence the interaction between the user and our system. Uh, so we need to decide what are the inputs that's accepted by the system, for example. Are we going to design and implement a voice-first interaction technique or a screen-first device and so on. And also we have to design uh, what are the possible commands and what are the possible answers. Mm -hmm. um, so. Typically, uh, voice interaction between people and devices is like uh, learning a new language, mm? uh, both for users and also for designers and developers. Uh, and foreign languages are typically learned through a sort of immersion. So uh, you have to also design this kind of flow that guides users in learning what to say and the different commands that they can give to the, to the device. Um, but there is this important point, people often, often have unrealistic expectations about this kind of device. Let me... Uh, no. 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 Okay. Um, so people uh, often have unrealistic expectations about this, this kind of device. So they think about uh, voice user interfaces as a natural conversation partner. Um, so we need to be, to design proper expectations towards our users um, because the frustration is typically bigger than with graphical user interfaces. Mm -hmm. So we need to set some boundaries uh, and we need to make users understand what our system can do and, and what it cannot do, right? This was also a guideline, if I remember correctly. So to design a voice user interface, um, the first step is always understanding who are your users um, and also what, are, what they are communicating about. So, you should define our target population and also the main goal of our, of our conversational assistant. In a way, we are trying to understand what are the needs of our user and what are the needs that our system will, will solve. 
Then you can write some sample dialogues on a sheet of paper uh, and sketch maybe some diagram of the conversational flow um, so that you can restart designing your, your dialogues and your comments and your, your answers. And having this kind of dialogues on a sheet of paper, you can also try these dialogues with, with someone before starting in implementing the, the tool. Um, so focus on the spoken conversation before considering any visual or technical element. Um, and typically, uh, you should imagine to work with a voice-only device. Mm -hmm. So at least this is a suggestion. So, uh, when you are starting to design this kind of conversational assistance, imagine to work with a device that just offers voice as the main interaction modality. Then you can add a screen later. Um, you can try to also to categorize the dialogues that you can design uh, in different categories. Um, so you can have controlling dialogues. Uh, to specify a goal uh, and also how to achieve this goal. Mm -hmm. So, for example, with your um, conversational assistant, a user could say, okay, play radio DJ from this specific app, tune, tune in. Mm -hmm. So, the, if you are designing, if you are implementing a dialogue like this, you allow your user to specify a goal and also how to implement this goal. Um, you can also have some delegating dialogues. In this case, you are asking your system to uh, achieve a goal without specifying how. For example, play some jazz music. You are delegating to the system um, this, this task of finding some jazz music and you are not specifying any, any mobile application at all. Mm? Um, so you can implement both dialogues, you can select one of them, so your conversational agent can be more delegating, can be more controlling, it depends. Uh, and these are the two most common cases, I would say. Then you can also have guiding dialogues and collaborating dialogues. So guiding dialogues are important, uh, especially for onboarding, so for novice users, right? So to guide the user in understanding, for example, what are the available comment, uh, comments. Hmm? Um, so for example, a user with this kind of conversational agents could ask, I want to hear some music, how should I do it? Hmm? So the user is asking the system uh, how to perform uh, a given goal. Mm? And then, it's, I would say, less common, you can also have collaborating dialogues. So the user and the system collaborates on, for example, deciding which is the goal mm? and how to achieve it. Mm? What should we do together? So this is a quest question from the user and the conversational uh, uh, agents probably will reply with some, uh, I don't know, suggestions on possible tasks that can be performed with, with, with the system. So collaborating dialogues. Um, yeah, currently, as I said before, the first two are the most common and are the ones that are implemented in contemporary voice user, uh, user interfaces. Um, then again, the suggestion is to use established guidelines and tools. So the guidelines for human AI interaction that we have seen last time uh, can, be, um, can be used for designing conversational assistance. Of course, you will find some guidelines that mm, don't apply to your use case, but most of the guidelines can be, can be relevant for this, for this task. Um, and also there is the, no, it's not reported here, but the playbook uh, example, the playbook tool that we have seen last time can help you in uh, understanding how to start the design of the system, telling you some use cases and some errors that should be taken into account when designing this, this system.
Okay, this was a very brief introduction to conversational assistance. I don't know if you have any questions on this. Um, I will show you now two possible examples, two practical examples of uh, very basic conversational assistance uh, so that you can also start your practical work. Um, how can we, after having designed them, how can we implement these kind of systems? Um, today I think we have two different uh, possibilities. One is ex exploiting these um, conversational platforms um, like Dialogflow. I don't know if you, if you have already used Dialogflow. Uh, we will see an example. Um, these platforms offer you some natural language processing um, for you uh, so you don't have to implement this, this part that is the most difficult one about understanding the meaning of, of the user commands a and you can actually exploit these natural language processing capabilities to implement your, your own conversational agent. Uh, and you can also use integrate this platform into mobile application, other websites and, and so on. So they focus on simplicity and abstraction. You don't need to know anything about natural language processing uh, you just have to yeah, uh, implement your, your dialogue flows. Um, there are two main families of these uh, conversational platforms. You can have extension of an existing product, um, for example, uh, skills for Amazon Echo. I don't know if you uh, have already implemented that skill from, for an Amazon Echo, for Amazon Alexa. You can basically add some f functionality to your Alexa. Mm? You can develop a conversational assistant for Alexa for your specific task and you can add this uh, conversational assistant to, to your own Alexa and you can also share it uh, for other users of course. Uh, and the same is for actions on, on Google. And you can also have standalone services um, like, for example, Dialogflow, IBM Watson, and, and so on. And we'll focus on, on Dialogflow. So Dialogflow is, um, it was a startup that was acquired by Google. Um, and it's free to use, at least for simple usage. Um, and you can have one click integration with several services like Telegram, Facebook Messenger, but also Google Assistant and you can also insert this in a mobile application, for example. Uh, it supports multiple language and there are REST APIs and uh, official SDKs for several languages. Mm. Um, yeah, instead of looking at the slides, let's, let's see how it works in practice. Um, we have prepared uh, an example that you can download from this uh, repository. Uh, basically, there is a zip file in this repository that you can then import in Dialogflow. Okay? It's a conversational assistant about weather that you can just import in Dialogflow to see how it works. So let's close the slides. Let's mirror the screen if I can. Okay. So this is the repository. It includes the zip file, which is the uh, conversational assistant for Dialogflow, uh, and also a very simple uh, graphical user interface developed in Python through which you can interact with this conversational assistant. Okay. So the first thing to do is to download the zip file and to import it into Dialogflow. Dialogflow.cloud.google.com um, I think in the, yes, in the settings, I have already imported it, but anyway, just to show you how you can import an existing, uh,
Uh, uh, uh, uh. Okay. Now this is my example. Okay, in some part of the interface there is an import button through which you can import your a zip file uh, and import the uh, the conversational agent. I will try to find it later. Now let's look at the example uh, then you can also try on your computer. So I have already imported no, it's not this one. It's this one. This is the uh, imported conversational agent. Basically, in uh, Dialogflow, you have two main important uh, concepts, intents and entities. Okay? Intents are, uh, they map a part of the dialogue. Okay? They map an answer from the user and the response of the conversational assistant. And you can obviously have multiple intents in your conversational agent uh, so that you can answer to different user questions. Mm -hmm. uh, in this case, it's a very, very simple conversational agent. You just have three intents mm -hmm. and there are also two default intents that are automatically created by Dialogflow which are the default welcome intent and the default fallback intent. So the default welcome intent is the first part of the dialogue. So when the interaction starts. Okay, so if I click on the intent, I can see that there are some training phrases. Um, and these training phrases are used by Dialogflow to map this intent to a specific request from the user. And since this is the default welcome intent, this intent is activated when the user says something like this, these sentences. Hello, hi, hi there, and so on. So it's a sort of wake word. Um, so the user doesn't need to use exactly one of these phrases uh, because there is some natural language processing algorithm that can also mix them and understand also similar sentences to activate this default welcome intent. And when the user says something like this, this intent answers with one of these sentences, okay? It randomly selects one of them at, and answers, for example, hi, how are you doing, okay? So it's an intent, the first answer response uh, when the conversation starts, okay? Then we also have the default fallback intent, and this is the intent that is used when the conversational assistant is not able to understand a command, a given command. So there are no training phrases in this case, and when Dialogflow is not able to map the user input to one of the intents, it answers with one of these, of these sentences. Hmm? I didn't get that, can you say it again, and so on. Okay, when you create a Dialogflow project, these two intents are automatically created for you. And then we have the main intent for this very simple conversational agent, uh, which is this one, ask whether. So through this conversational agent, the user can ask some information about whether. Uh, also in this case, we have some training phrases and some responses. In this case, responses are static. Also in your case, responses can be static. You don't have to uh, implement uh, any kind of uh, algorithms to answer dynamically to the user. So let's focus on the training phrases. Uh, will it be snowing in Turin tomorrow? Tell me the weather in Rome, and so on. What's the difference here? If you can see, there are some words that are highlighted, right? Um, and these words are mapped on entities. What are entities? Are a sort of variable, okay? So for example, Turin in this case is labeled as a city, okay? This is an entity, a predefined entity that already exists on uh, Dialogflow, but you can also create your own variables. Mm -hmm. And for example, tomorrow is labeled as a date, 
Again, it's a predefined entity. Mm -hmm. um, what's the purpose of um, labeling these words as entities, in your opinion? They can be a parameter. Uh, so with this kind of labeling uh, activity, then the user is able, or the user can, ask information for any city in the world. Okay? And this city is automatically mapped in a, in a real city. So in your code, you can potentially extract, easily extract the city, maybe make a query to an external service, get the actual weather for that city and answer to the user, okay? Um, this is the first advantage. And the other advantage is that you can use these uh, entities also in the response, okay? So with this basic conversational assistant, if the user asks, what's the weather in, I don't know, uh, in Rome or in any city in the world, what's the weather in London? This kind of conversational assistant will answer, it will be sunny in London, okay? okay the answer in this case is static, but you can reuse the entity of, of the included in the, in the command, okay? And entities are defined here in this menu. Uh, right now we just have used uh, system entities, so they are already defined, cities and dates, but you can also create your own entities so that you can then label uh, your training phrases with your own entities. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Okay, um, so right now again everything is uh, quite static. So if the user says something like this, this intent will always answer in this way. Mm -hmm. If you want to develop something more uh, real world, I would say, um, you can also um, enable fulfillment. Through fulfillment, you can uh, connect uh, your own code, for example, your own website developed in Python, I don't know, to Dialogflow, so that when the user type a specific command, um, this fulfillment will contact your server. In your server, you can perform some operation. You can, for example, query some external service for weather, and then you can send your answer back to the Dialogflow that will generate the answer okay this is how typically works with dialog flow uh, you are not asked to implement fulfillment in in this course uh, but it's important to understand how how it works in practice right now you can already try your your system uh, this conversational agent which is static and you have different options one option is to use an external um, Graphical user interface, we will see in a minute how to do that. But you can also use uh, an, online, uh, an online tool. Um, if you go here in integrations, as you can see, you can integrate this conversational agent with different services, including Telegram, Slack, and so on. And you also have a web demo that allows you to No, it's not the web. Yes, it's the web demo. Okay, yes. Uh, that allows you to try your conversational assistant with a web-based interface. So again, here I can try my conversational assistant. So this is the default welcome intent. As you can say, good day, what can I do for you today? If I type something that is not recognized, tell me a joke. The conversational assistant maps this request to the, to the default fallback intent. But if I ask what's the weather like in London, 
the conversational assistant answered to me, it will be sunny in London. Okay, so the conversational assistant mapped this on the ask weather intent and it mapped this uh, to, to a city mm, that has been used also in the response. You can, of course, use the web demo or you can use the basic graphical user interface that we have created for you. Um, I can also try to run this if it works. It's included in the same um, GitHub repository. It uses Flask, so basically Python. No, it's not working. It was working yesterday. Uh, maybe I have to There are some problems with the libraries. I will try to fix this later uh, and then I will show you the interface. Uh, anyway, it's a very basic uh, website with a sort of input text box uh, to which you can write your commands and communicate mm, with, with Dialogflow. Let me see if I can. Um, basically, to exploit this code, you have to do two things. Um, one is to change this with the name of your um, the name of your uh, conversational assistant, the name of the project on Dialogflow. For example, uh, in my case, is is this one, and I will I will show you uh, where this name can be found. Um, and the other thing is to you have to create um, an API key to interact with, with Dialogflow. Uh, basically, when you create a, a new project on, on Dialogflow, uh, Google also creates for you uh, a project in the Google console. I don't remember exactly the name of Google, the Google console. Yes, on the Google Cloud Console. For example, when I have imported the, the, the conversational assistant, Google created this, this project in the Google Cloud Console. Uh, so you basically have to copy this name uh, here in the code. It's already the same name. And also you have to create a, a key for interacting with, with uh, dialog flow so here in the console yes uh. Somewhere, you should find a way to create a, a key, which is actually a JSON file that you can copy in your, in your uh, folder. Security. Key management, maybe. No, it's not this one. API keys, okay, credentials. Okay, and here you can create a new key somewhere. Manage service accounts, okay, 
and okay this was my key you can create a new key by clicking probably create a service account yes you can give a name to the service account here you have to assign a role to this service account I suggest you to select Dialogflow API admin so we are giving access to our uh, website this kind of privileges then continue then done probably okay this is my client for my client I don't have any key so I can click here and I can probably somewhere I can create a key for this service no yes no keys maybe here manage keys yes add key create new key okay json and it should yes downloads a json file with a key included yes basically you have to copy this this file within the folder of your uh, graphical user interface which is now here and I have already copied this and it's this one clientsecret.json you can also rename the file and the important thing is that this name is then used here okay clientsecret.json then if, if you have any problems in, in making this working, I can, I can help you. Um, okay, this was the first example. Uh, you can, of course, start from this code uh, to update, to modify it, and, and implementing your, your own uh, conversational assistant. Uh, the other example... <laughs> is about chat gpt so this is an option implementing your conversational assistant exploiting dialogflow uh, designing your conversation your conversational flows and implementing them through intents and, and entities the alternative is uh, using uh, uh, chat gpt or better the open ai uh, apis uh, do you have already used them in your research activities? No. Um, also in this case there is an example uh, that you can modify. Uh, it's on this repository. Um, so let's see how it works. First of all you need to uh, install some libraries. It exploits Python so you have to install op the OpenAI library for Python and also the Gradio library for Python that is used for creating the user interface. Uh, then the second step is to again get a key for using the OpenAI uh, APIs. It's simpler in this case, I think. Um, and then you can build the chatbot uh, using the APIs uh, through via Python in this case. Um, you can use these APIs for free if you have a new account. So ChatGPT is offering you some free tire. Uh, so you can uh, use these APIs uh, when you have a new account. Um, otherwise, you will need to, to pay for it. Mm -hmm. And this is how you can get um, the API key. So you, it's simpler, I think, you go on ChatGPT, on the OpenAI website. Uh, yes. Of course, you need an account. Mm -hmm. Yes. 
yes, I don't remember the password. I created this account yesterday. Let's move to my traditional account. Okay, basically you have to go here, API keys, and then you can create a new secret key, okay? Uh, you create a new secret key, you give a name, yes, create secret key, this is the key that you should copy instantly, otherwise it will disappear. Copy it and you will uh, insert this key within the code that I will show you in a moment. Uh, so let's open the repository here from Visual Studio Code. Okay. Uh, again, this is a very simple conversational agent um, and you have to insert your your key here okay that's it then with the key if you run this uh, python file you will have access to um, uh, conversational interface So if I run this Python file, let's hope it will work. Okay. No. You have access to this interface through which you can type something and then you get back uh, an answer from chat gpt now it there will probably some errors yeah there is an error because i've used my traditional account and i have already uh, i do not i do not have free access to the apis because it, it's an old account um, but basically, if you use your account to create an API key, you will be able to use uh, this kind of uh, APIs for free. Um, and basically what happens here is that you can write something and you get an answer from ChatGPT. Okay, so basically you can, uh, you can ask whatever you want to ChatGPT. Um, obviously, it's not our case because in our case, we would like to design our conversation uh, we would like to design how we can for example recover from errors what are the available commands and, and so on so using chat gpt uh, i think is more difficult because you also have to maybe intercept the answer from chat gpt and maybe uh, maybe you have to change something to respect for example a given guideline um, from from microsoft research for example um, there is um, a possibility here that is shown here. Um, you can also send a first message to ChatGPT uh, saying, for example, um, which is the goal of your conversational assistant. So, for example, uh, in this case, in this example, we are saying to ChatGPT, you are an AI specialized. Um, conversational assistant in food do not answer anything other than food related queries you can try it uh, with this example if you ask something different uh, for example something about the weather uh, your conversational assistant will answer that um, it's not able to answer this kind of questions uh, um, ask me something about food okay so in a first instance you can also define the scope of your of your conversational assistant and also the tone of your conversational assistant with this first very first message um, then i don't know if this is sufficient for designing entirely your conversational flows and for respecting all the guidelines that we have seen last time so you can try uh, by personalizing your conversational assistant in this way 
but differently from dialogue flow in which you have full control on the conversation here you will probably need to maybe intercept some some answers and maybe design something different uh, with respect to uh, what happens uh, with, with this basic uh, conversational assistant any questions so i think we can have a 15 minutes break now and then we can start uh, the exercise um, after a, a good coffee Okay, um, there were some problems before, so just to show you the examples uh, running. Um, so this is the example about dialogue flow. Um, I didn't do anything special, now it's working, I don't know. Anyway, uh, to use it, you should install these requirements, of course, before uh, starting the the Python file mm. um, and basically this is the interface I don't know if you can see it but let me make some zoom here on the bottom there is a text box in which you can insert your text hello and this is the answer from Dialogflow okay uh, so Tell me the weather in London. Okay, it will be sunny in London. Uh, you can also use the microphone here. Uh, so you can also use your voice. Uh, yeah, I have to tell me the weather in London. Okay, it works. Uh, and it also. Uh, reproduce the answer by a voice now it's not working because I have the microphone but if you try it on your on your computer it will also uh, answer to you by a voice so you can use this example uh, made in Python to decide for example uh, if you are going to use just text text plus voice just voice you can you can decide you can decide and of course in this case you have full control on your conversation because you have your intents and you can map the different parts of the dialogue um, just again to recap to import uh, this example you have to create a new agent in Dialogflow okay and when you have created the new agent let's, let's create it test After a while, yes, um, Okay, uh, and when you are in, on your new agent, you can click on the settings, and here you have export and import, and you can import your zip file, mm -hmm. and it will import your entities, your intents uh, included in the zip file. Again, for using the Python code, uh, you have to mainly do uh, two things first of all when you create your agent here on Dialogflow uh, as I said before Google will create for you a project on the cloud console so you go on the console.google uh, console.cloud.google.com and you will find 
a new project here. Mm? This is the name for my project, class example with some letters. You have to copy this name and paste it um, here in the Python code. Okay, this is the third thing. Uh, and the other thing is to generate a key for accessing via an API Dialogflow, okay? And from the Google Cloud, you go to uh, more products. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. Service account. Where is this? Let's search for it. Let's look for keys. API keys, you can, you can write API keys here. Uh, credentials. Then you have to create, first of all, a service account that will represent your uh, client. Um, so you can click on manage service account and you create a service account in this menu. And when you have created it, you can click on it. For example, this was the test account that I've created before. And here, within the information about this account, I can click on keys and I can generate my, my key. Mm? So create new key, JSON file, and that's it, okay? Um, of course, in the service account, I have to specify that the role of this service account is Dialflow admin, okay? So when you create a new service account, test to create, here I have to select a role related to Dialogflow. So I can look for Dialogflow uh, and my suggestion is to use Dialogflow API admin. Okay, so if you create a service account like this and then you create a, a key, you will have access to the, all the API of Dialogflow. So you download your JSON file and you put your JSON file within the folder of uh, of the example, right? So in my case, it's on the desktop here, there flow weather, and I passed the, the, the JSON file here. And then the important thing is that the name of the file is the same of, of this one, okay? So basically I've renamed my JSON file in client uh, secret.json. Okay, this was the example uh, on Dialogflow. Let's open the uh, ChatGPT example. I've now included a, a key from my new account, so now it should work. Uh, again, there is n the code is very limited, also in this case. Um, again, as you can see, there is this first message through which I can sort of define the scope of the assistant and also maybe the tone of the conversation. You can try to uh, use this first message to set up, personalize your, your uh, conversational assistant. Let's run it. So now uh, the first message is, you are an AI specialized bot in food. Do not answer anything other than food related queries. So if I run this, maybe, yes, oops. Hello. Okay, this is my, uh, the answer from chat GPT. As you can see, the answer is already related to the food context. How can I assist you with food related queries today? Um, for example, tell me a receipt. Uh, 
okay uh, and chat gpt is answering to me with, with a specific uh, receipt spaghetti aglio olio perfect um uh, and also you don't you don't have full control on, on the answer right so this is the answer from chat gpt so you should find a way maybe to uh, i don't know if it's possible with the first message but maybe to define also the tone of these answers to respect for example the guidelines uh, that we have seen last time uh, and here if i say tell me a joke for example So something that is not directly related to food. Okay, in this case, uh, the bot is providing an answer to me, but it's still related to the food, right? So here is a food related joke for you. So through the first message, we can in a way um, personalizing uh, our uh, conversations. But then we, we prob you probably need to implement something more. For example, uh, in designing this system, you will need to also design how to recover from errors. Okay, so how can we recover from errors in this case? Uh, also, the tone of the conversation is important. So uh, you can act in different ways, probably. You can try to, this will be more difficult probably, you can try to intercept the answer from ChatGPT and maybe modify it in some way. Or you can maybe focus on the input of the user. So the, the user is saying something, um, I get this input and I modify it to get a specific response from ChatGPT. Okay? Maybe adding some keyword to, to the answer or some sentence to the, sorry, not to the answer, to the, to the request, okay? So you can maybe append, uh, you can append the user request with, please use a friendly tone, for example, to get a specific tone from ChatGPT. Maybe this is hidden for the user, it happens uh, behind the code, uh, but you can try to, uh, guide the conversation uh, according to your needs mm -hmm. so for sure this is pro using chat gpt is probably more interesting but at the same time it requires some some coding some some trick to guide the conversation so let's see the text for the exercise you should already know what you have expected to do uh, so the goal is to yes thank you uh, what about the flag button uh, this was included in the example of the user interface well yeah maybe you can save uh, uh, an answer but it's not strictly related to our our use case it was a button that is included in the example i found this user interface online so it's not important it, it could be uh, a way of something based on this to recover yes of course you can start from this uh, very simple user interface uh, and you can modify it and you can add your own buttons your own strategies to recover from errors you can do whatever you want basically okay So the goal is to prototype, design and prototype a conversational agent, uh, um, which is interactive. It should be uh, vocal and or textual. You can, you can decide, taking into account the advantages and disadvantages we have seen today. Um, the answers will be or can be fake, can be static, like in the example in Dialogflow. Um, so your prototype will uh, always answer the same two three things for each different question it is not important of course if you use chat gpt uh, you have for free this kind of uh, dynamic answers uh, if you use uh, dialogflow static answers are fine okay so the first step is to define the scope of your uh, prototype um, so decide what the conversational agent should be able to do. Um, again, 
for this exercise the intelligence is not in the answer or in the natural language processing the intelligence should be mainly in the conversational part so you should really design a good conversational flow that respects for example the guidelines that we have seen um, you should write the topic the idea the problem to be solved uh, in a slide so our app will support help this target population uh, will solve these specific needs uh, and so on then after having decided the topic and the target population you should design the conversational interface um, you can design the user interface if you may if you are uh, using a screen first or a mixed interaction uh, in a slide and more importantly you should design and write uh, the conversational flows so the dialogues uh, saying if the answer will be textual vocal uh, only or you will use a screen and so on uh, how to recover from errors is important which is the tone of the conversational assistant how many details the conversational assistant is providing and also which human AI interaction guidelines our uh, your uh, system will will follow or ignore and why mm? um, and in making this I suggest you also to try to implement uh, maybe a use case a scenario with some very specific uh, requests and answers from a fictional user for example and this can help you in designing uh, your conversational flows and again please use the guidelines and also the playbook mm? through which you can start your design activity specifying for example that you are going to design a conversational assistant via voice and so on and the playbook will give you some use case some things some errors to be taken into account in this uh, phase mm -hmm. so uh, all this happens before coding mm -hmm. before implementing and then step two is to prototype your conversational assistant um, again you can start from the examples um, basically um, you can also use exactly uh, the graphical user interface of the dialogue flow example then you create a dialogue flow conversational assistant and you just have to implement your intents and your entities so you can also avoid coding at all um, of course you can design your prototype to fulfill uh, uh, different needs and different goals uh, in the implementation phase you can focus on a limited set of functionality uh, so for the implementation choose the main functionalities one or two are sufficient and try to implement them uh, by using Dialogflow or the OpenAI APIs and the final step will be to share your results uh, the design of your prototype, the goal, the needs that the prototype solve um, in a final presentation um, in the next lesson so put together the slides you prepared add a couple of screenshots and screen recordings and more importantly prepare a short demo of your of your system mm? so that you can show your system working to, to us uh, and to the class to the teachers and to the class okay and this will happen probably in the last two hours of the next lesson uh, we are uh, seven groups I think so I think 15-20 minutes per, per group it's a reasonable uh, amount of time uh, also don't forget to submit the, uh, the assignment so besides presenting you should also submit your material the slides that you prepared um, on uh, on this link okay by the end of uh, february 12th which is the day of the last lesson okay yeah this is x number three not four of course any questions
okay so mm -hmm. you can you can start working on your uh, project and if you have any questions feel free to ask me